Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, different openings that you can play as a player at different levels and what openings you should be playing at different levels as a player to try to work on your chess game so that you can become a better chess player. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please hit that subscribe button and click on your notification icon. So now I'm going to kind of set up like little brackets. So like the first bracket is going to be like sub 1000. Like what types of openings should you be playing at the sub 1000 level uh, if you want to get better? Now for me, this is hard because my very first published rating was 1255 and I was six years old. So I have to remember back to when I was five and I was playing a lot of unrated chess tournaments. And at that point I was probably sub 1000 and I have to think about what openings I was playing. So at five, like my chess game wasn't very evolved. I just learned how to move the pieces and I didn't know a whole lot of patterns yet. So one of the things that I kept trying to do over and over again is I kept trying to pull off that four move checkmate. And of course, I had terrible results with it. Like after e5, I tried to be a little bit sneakier than just playing queen f3 or queen h5. I would play bishop c4, and then I would hope that they wouldn't play knight f6, and I would try to sneak in like queen h5 or queen f3 and queen f7. But you know, at five, your judgment isn't always that great. So even if they played knight f6, sometimes you'd have to you'd try to sneak in queen h5, and then they would take it. You know, and you'd be like, oh no, I lost my queen. But of course, they might still miss it. They might play knight c6, and then you could you know you could get away with your with your checkmate. But I would try various different ways of playing for four move checkmate. I I remember I would even occasionally you know reorganize my queen. Like I got more and more sophisticated with the ways I would try to get the four move checkmate. Like they would play knight f6, and I would play d4. You know, and then my whole idea was here I could play e5 and I kept getting more sophisticated I was thinking now they're going to play queen g8 now I can play queen h5 so I kept coming up with more sophisticated ways uh, to try to get the four move checkmate and that was basically how I played chess when I was five so I think actually when you're five a totally reasonable way to maybe play chess is to try to just play like queen h5 you know, not just when you're five, but like sub 1000, like queen h5 might be reasonable and just learn how to attack and just learn how to try to get your queen and bishop to get checkmate. There's nothing terribly wrong with having this phase as a player. And a lot of players have this phase. Uh, but the important thing is you have to move past it. And keep in mind, I moved past this phase in less than a year. I was only getting two out of five points in every tournament that I played in when I was five, and I couldn't even break the 50% barrier. And it was very frustrating for me. So one of the things that people told me was, well, don't play all these early queen moves in bishop c4, start playing knight f3. So before I became 1255 at, at six years old, I'd already started playing knight f3 in most of my games. And most of my games were Italian games back then. So it was knight c6, and then I would play bishop c4, and then we would play Italian games. So then when you're playing Italian games, you're getting a lot more super tactical positions. Uh, you're hoping for the two knights defense when you're a kid, because then you get to play the fried liver. And you get to play these super sacrificial attacks, like beginning with knight f7, king f7, queen f3. And guess what? Doesn't this look a lot like the four move checkmate? So it was like the four move checkmate was still in my repertoire. You know, somebody showed me this and that allowed me to stop playing for the four move checkmate. Because guess what? Now a very similar situation is possible. Like if they play king e8 here, I can I can get the four move checkmate, but I can get it a couple moves later. I get it on move nine instead of move four. And it looks the same. It's the same pattern that I'm already familiar with. Um, so this is a pretty steady evolution of openings, you know, to go to the Italian game, to go to uh, like the two knights defense. And it's also a pretty solid evolution of openings to eventually just at this point in your chess development, like right around 1200. And really like right around 1200 all the way up to about 1500 is where you want to start incorporating really as many gambits into your opening play as possible. So like against bishop c5. Uh, you'd want to play the Evans Gambit. I know a lot of people that also had, uh, for example, the Goring Gambit in the repertoire. After knight c6, they would play d4, and they would play like a Goring Gambit. Now, the advantage of playing Gambits at this rating range, you know, like between 1200 and 1500, or really anything sub-1500, is because you lose most of your games because of one-move blunders, because of falling from mate, or hanging your queen in one move. Or in some cases, slightly more sophisticated blunders like, you know, two move blunders and stuff like that. And what playing these gambits really does, it teaches you to look for these one move blunders and these one move tricks. You know, a great example is just taking advantage of a loose piece, like say on the a5 square, like d4 here, queen b3, queen e7, and then something like d5, knight d8, and then pause the video and see if you can find it. Queen b5 wins this bishop for free. So learning to catch things like that is a really important part of your chess development because you have to use tactics 
throughout your chess career. So playing gambits and playing all kinds of different weird gambits, like I think all the way up to like the 1500 level, is really an important part of your chess development. Now, once you get past 1500, uh, the, the biggest weakness that you're going to have and some of the biggest problems that you're going to have in getting better are going to be uh, twofold. Like this is the hardest spot for people to get past usually. Is people will get to 1500 and they have a very difficult time advancing from here. Another big stumbling point is sometimes they get about 200 points past 1500. Sometimes they get to 1700 and they have a very difficult time advancing from there. And part of that is because at this point in your chess career, it's just a lot more work needs to be done to get better. You have to start working on end games. You have to start memorizing complete games. Uh, you have to start memorizing full games, full middle games. Your opening theory has to be much, much deeper. And you kind of have to work on all of these things all at once. It's no one thing that you can work on. Now, you can work on some of this stuff by changing around uh, your, your openings. Um, but... As far as like the big changes to the openings, like going from e4 to d4, for example, like I see a lot of people around this rating range switch from e4 to d4 and try to play passive London setups and things like that. I think that's a switch that you want to wait until you're about 2000 or 2200, because I still think you have a lot of stuff to learn in e4 before you switch over to d4. Same thing with the Sicilian. You're, you're not really ready to play a Sicilian until you're like, you know, 2000 or 2200, until you're playing really solid, really accurate chess, and you're not making a lot of mistakes, you're not making a lot of blunders, and you're already in the habit of learning opening theory much deeper. You know, I think one of the big evolutions is just learning complete games. So, like, uh, a great example is, like, take the Evans Gambit, for example. One of the early games that I completely memorized uh, was this game Bobby Fischer uh, versus uh, Ruben Fine, which went uh, E captures D4, and then we had something like uh, Castle's Kingside, and in the Ruben Fine game, he played the fully compromised defense with queen b3, and then it was queen e7, knight c3, knight f6, knight d5. And again, I'm doing this game just from memory, so I might get one move wrong just because of poetic license. But this was a famous game. He played uh, h4, which temporarily distracted the queen. Uh, we had queen takes, we had bishop takes g7, rook over, and then rook a e1. I don't remember which rook he moved. It might have been this one. So, like I said, a little bit of poetic license here. I also don't remember if he took the rook or not. I just remember it was winning. I think he might not have taken the rook. So I'm going to try to remember the game perfectly. Um, I think maybe he took it, though. He might have took it. But anyways, bishop takes, rook takes, king d8, and then queen g3, and Ruben Fine resigned uh, with the black pieces because, of course, if queen g3, we have bishop f6 mate, and the queen effectively couldn't move anywhere else. So this was one of the first games that I completely memorized. So this was like... 18 moves that I'd memorized and it was like right around the 1500 to 1700 level that I'd memorized this game and of course another early game that I memorized was of course uh, Paul Morphy versus uh, the Duke and the Count which is another full game that you should memorize uh, completely in full at some point and uh, that's of course a very good game to memorize if you're uh, playing against uh, the Philidor defense you know if D if D6 that game continued with uh, D4 and then we had uh, bishop g4, uh, d takes e5, bishop f3, queen f3, d takes, and then bishop c4. Another very tempting game to look at because that does, in fact, resemble the four-move checkmate pattern. Um, but again, like between the 1500 and 1700 level, you start memorizing full sets of games. So you're memorizing full games, and you're still working within that e4 framework, and you're trying to push your understanding of chess further and further and further. So when you're trying to get from 1800 to 2000, and from 2000 to 2200, like right in this range, from 1800 to 2000, you really have to start working on your end games. So one of the things you can start doing is you can start playing e4 with kind of an eye for pushing yourself into the end game a little bit faster, or trying to not avoid variations that lead to an end game. So when I was in that rating range, I started favoring things like the Ray Lopez exchange variation which would usually lead to an immediate endgame. A lot of times I would play this variation with like knight c3 and then d4, and then I would actually exchange queens, which is a version of the Lasker defense. And I actually, I used this years later. I needed to get a draw in the last round of this uh, big tournament, and uh, my opponent was, was rated like uh, 2,500, and uh, I was not rated 2,500 at the time. I think I was rated a hair under 2,300. And I had the white pieces and I needed to get a draw. And this is what I played. And I actually got the draw. It's very difficult for Black to make progress here. I found out that the position is a lot harder than I thought it was. He definitely presented me with a lot of problems. But 
but I, I got the draw. But this was an opening I was familiar with because I would I would play this opening like between eighteen hundred and two thousand, and I would try to get to the end game faster. And you're just trying to play your end games, and you're trying to play a lot of openings that lead to end games that don't necessarily end in the opening. So this is where you're getting away from your gambits. This is where you're playing more quieter positions, where maybe you're playing a mainline Roy Lopez, or in the Italian game, instead of playing some uh, gambit, maybe, uh, or instead of playing d4, you're playing more of a quiet game, like you're going to play bishop c4, bishop c5, d3. This is when you're playing stuff like that. So then at a certain point, like you're not doing very good in positions where there's not a whole lot going on and you're not doing very good at quiet positions. This is like right around the 2000 to 2200 range. This is a good time to change up your openings a little bit. Try to incorporate some D4, possibly incorporate some C4, possibly incorporate some Sicilians to try to help with your positional play and how to play chess in slow positions. Now, all the while you have to be working on, this is where you're putting in tons and tons of work at this point, at this level. And you're trying to memorize your openings and have your theory down perfectly. You're trying to memorize all of your very serious big time end games that you're gonna get into, um, at least all the theoretical ones that you can memorize. And you're gonna be doing all the work there. And then when you get above that level, um, you, you just have to keep doing more and more of all the same work. And also you have to do more and more. Like right now, what's keeping me from getting to the next level is I just don't do enough work on my tactics. So I'm not calculating as cleanly or as perfectly as guys that are, you know, higher rated than me. And, um, you know, that prevents me from moving up to the next level. And uh, there, there's a lot of guys that are trying to move up to the next level from where they're at. And it's just unclear what they have to work on, you know, because you're competing against a lot of guys at that point that are also working very, very hard. Uh, but that's basically the openings that you should be playing at different levels. You know, early on, you know, just, you know, try to play from eight. Uh, and then after that, try to play a lot of gambits, sacrifice a lot of material and just play very aggressive chess, learn your tactics, go crazy. After that, you know, the openings become a little bit quieter. You aim for the end game a little bit more. After that, you can then switch to your D4 and your Sicilians and your C5s. And then, you know, after that, it's just the opening doesn't matter very much after that. It's just how well you play your positions, how well you play your openings, how well you know your theory, and how well you can play chess after the opening is over with. But at that point, your opening choice makes almost no difference because you shouldn't have any uh, glaring weaknesses in your play that you need to fix. Uh, and if you do, you just need to do the work directly. You either need to work on the tactics directly, you need to memorize the positions that you're having trouble with directly, and and that's really the way to go at that point. Um, but anyways, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you can incorporate some of these ideas in your own games. Uh, thank you very much for watching.